Well, hot to everyone. Welcome back to the third and final video. We've talked about clothing, we've talked about tools, and now we're going to talk about decorations, right? So on the table here in front of me, I've got several things that most people are drawn to. When we bring out historic items and we start talking about our material culture, these are the things that everyone wants to look at and see closer and touch and feel and ask, how did you do that? How did they do that back then? What are, what are these made from? Um, so we're going to go into depth on some of these items. I'm going to talk about what I have here, and then I'm going to show you in depth how two of these arts are done. We're going to look at quill work, and we're going to look at finger weaving. So let me explain what I have here. I have three pairs of moccasins uh, in different stages of their creation and their wear. I have some uh, finger woven and heddle woven garters, the things that go about the knee that you saw in the first video. And then I have two quilled bags with deer hair decorations and tin cones. I have some silk ribbon, which you can see here on uh, this breech clout. I have a painted hide bag with deer tail cones. Um, I have a hair decoration uh, that's meant to be worn on the scalp lock, a quilled pipe stem with deer hair, a deer hair roach for the hair, and also the actual tail itself that this hair is coming from uh, that is dyed red with cleaver root, which is a natural uh, plant dye. Let's take a look real quick at the moccasins. These are one of the main things that everyone wants to see and touch and feel and take a look at. So these moccasins are brain tan deer hide um, and they are decorated on the tops here with quill work, porcupine quill work. Now these are not beads and they're not used like beads. These are porcupine quills, short little two inch quills that are soaked, dyed, and then used uh, to sew onto the leather itself. And we're going to show you how we do that, but these are the types of designs that you're going to see created by porcupine quill work. And here we also have this pair of red, white, yellow, and blue finger woven garters. Now these garters are woven from two ply wool yarn and they are decorated with glass beads. Prior to the introduction of sheep wool yarn and glass beads, Items like this are being made out of buffalo, dog, possum, and raccoon hair, and decorated with shell beads. It's a very tedious, very intricate work, but it produces some really beautiful items. So let's get a closer look at these things, and then I'll show you how some of these things are done. So the first thing about finger weaving is that you need to have the beads in place. Here you can see Shelly is sliding the beads up on the yarn. The cool thing is the beads are already there by the time you start weaving. So the beadwork is not done afterwards. You simply slide the beads up on the strands as you're weaving. And you can see here Shelly is going, adding the beads in, and then crossing those strands. One right about there. There it is. Slide the bead up, cross the strands. Now this is an oblique style weave, which means that the weaving is not done across and across in a 90 degree angle pattern. It's actually done in a crisscross. So you can see the diamond patterns show the way that this is done. You can see here that she's crossing those strands over, under, over, under, and over, and under until she gets to the very end, and then she'll turn and go back the other direction. This is an extremely intricate style of weaving, and she is a master at it. I've tried once, and uh, let's just say neither of us wanted to try and teach myself again. Like I said, historically this is being done with sheep's wool and glass beads, which is exactly what you see here. Two-ply fingering weight wool yarn in period correct colors and period size white glass beads. However, prior to the introduction of sheep's wool and glass beads, this same style of weaving is being done with buffalo hair, dog hair, possum and raccoon, 
and woven with shell beads instead of white glass beads. Still equally as beautiful, just not quite as vibrant. So here we are for quill work. Now, I have a couple of things on the table here. These are some tools that are important to me when using quill, uh, when doing quill work, and some of the examples of some finished items that uh, I'll show you the techniques on. The, the one that we're gonna be looking at today uh, is going to be this style of quill work that you saw on this pair of moccasins. The, zigzag stitch and you can see here exactly why it's called that so you can see this these individual rows of quill work that's what actually makes up the entirety of this moccasin it goes all the way down the toe and around the edges you can see what's known as lane stitch it's a single quill so how does this actually work? Well, I've got some quills here in water that are soaking. Now, the quills themselves, while these are softening, I'll show you. This is a box of plain white undyed quills. Now, porcupine quills are not very long. You can see this is, this is a fairly decently sized quill right here. And uh, it's not that long. It's solid white with a black tip, and this is where the sharp part is. This is the part that goes into the porcupine's skin down here. And this is what we use to create the quill work items. The quills have to be washed, and then sorted, and then dyed. And you can dye them any number of colors. Uh, red and orange is probably one of the most common colors historically. Now, this orange is dyed with... Um, uh, matter root or blood root and this red here and this red here are dyed with cleaver root and cleaver root is another uh, natural red dye it's a plant dye um, but it produces an extremely vibrant scarlet color as opposed to the orange color that we see in the blood root and matter root dyes both are historically accurate and this can even be over dyed to a dark red. So while we also have the zigzag quill work that I'm gonna be showing you here, another form of quill work that I pulled out um, that is not necessarily a needle and thread type quill work that I still thought was fun to mention was something like this quilled pipe stem. So this is my personal pipe um, and uh, this stem is quilled with porcupine quills and it gives it a nice pop of color, but how in the world are these quills attached? You can see here, as I move this pipe down, you can see the seam on the bottom where the quills are uh, sort of wrapped around the pipe stem and then tied in place as I'm going one quill at a time, tying those quills on. And that's how we get this nice, even banding of color that goes around. Here is a pipe stem that I'm currently working on. You can see that is how it's looking as I'm going along. And you can see two threads, and I'm simply tying a knot each time I add a new quill. I have a line drawn down the center to keep myself uh, heading in the right direction. Okay. So let's move some of this stuff out of the way, get organized, and I'll show you what I'm going to be doing. 
This is just going to be an example so that way you can get an idea of what the process is like. So I like to use uh, a very, very, very fine tipped pen. It helps me to keep my line straight. And we're going to be doing a little bit of quill work on this uh, deer hair roach. This is a hair decoration. Um, it is meant to be worn on the scalp lock uh, with a pin that goes through a small braid. So I need to create a line of quill work that goes all the way around from about here, all the way around. Okay, and there is the line that I will be following for this quill work. Now I will be using two separate needles and two separate pieces of thread. So the way that this quill work actually works is that you have uh, two distinct needles and two distinct threads and you're taking the needles and threads, which are stitching on one side of the row of quill work, and you're taking the quill and actually folding it, starting on one side, folding it across, stitching it down, folding it back across, stitching it down, folding it back, stitching it down, and you go on and on and on until you run out of quill. Maybe you only have that much left, just enough for one more fold. So what you would do then is you would take a new quill, insert it into the place uh, over or behind the quill that's ending, fold both of them over, and then continue to quill. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So you can see here that I have the threads laid out. And I've got two threads connected to two individual needles. So this is my starting point. So what I'm gonna do is just make sure my threads are separate. Keep everything organized as much as possible. And then I'm going to make one stitch Apologize if this is blurry. Let's get that in there. I'm gonna make one stitch. Push it through. And I'm not gonna pull it all the way. So I'm gonna leave a little loop here. So now I'm going to take a single quill that's been soaking in water. I'm going to snip off the tip, flatten that quill with my thumbnail. So now you can see the quill goes from being round to very flat, right? Uh, some of the pith might come out of it as well. And that is what is going to allow us to stitch that quill down to the roach. So let's see. I'm going to take that, pop it in there. Now I'm going to pull that cord tight. And fold the quill over. Take the other needle and using my thumb as a guide, I'm going to stitch on my line just there. Oh, it's tough to stitch on stiff leathers because you need it to bend. You get a very, very specific catch. 
you're only sewing through just a teeny tiny little bit of leather because really it's only to hold this quill down. So now it's sewed down and I fold it back the other direction. And this is what creates the pattern, just repeating this motion over and over and over again. I get a quill, I fold it, and I stitch it in place with my needle. Fold it. Pull that thread tight. Fold it again. So now I'm starting to get a little bit of a pattern. And I repeat that all the way along the edge of this roach. And that is how I would quill a roach. <sighs> All right, well, we have covered clothing, we have covered tools, and we have covered decorative arts. My hope for this is that you will walk away with an appreciation and an understanding of these material items as connections to the people who made them. That's how I like to look at these things, and that's what I try to teach about. Someone who's not familiar with Shawnee history or culture, or has never met a Shawnee person, probably still knows what a tomahawk is, or knows what a bow is, or knows what a moccasin is. So through these material items, I have the opportunity to connect with people who I might not have anything in common with other than the fact that we're human. So thank you for taking the time to watch these videos. Thank you to the Iridale Museums who made this possible, and I very much hope that I can see you again in the future. Nyawe, hine kuchi.